Bill R. Lynn, B I L L L Y N N. Mm -hmm. What is your birthday? April the 24th, 1930. Where were you born? Vernon, Texas. Where? Hmm? Texas, where? Vernon. What? Burn? Vernon, B E R O N. B E R O N. Uh huh. Oh. Up, up by Wichita Falls. I see. Tell me about your family when you were growing up. Parents and your siblings. Well, my, my dad, he, he worked in oil fields for several years. He worked in oil fields and World War II broke out. He uh, he working in the shipyards in Houston down there for a little while and he come back up here and Tyler went to work for the Cotton Belt Railroad. And while he was working for the Cotton Belt Railroad, uh, they drafted him into World War II and he went to El Paso and he was the instructor at uh, El Paso. And my mother was a stay at home and I had uh, two more brothers and a sister there and they were all younger than I was. You were the eldest? Yes, I was the oldest. <clears throat> what year did you graduate high school? Uh, I, 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 quit, I quit school in junior high. I went in Marine Corps in 1946 at the age of two weeks after turning 16. <laughs> and then I stayed there a little while. My commanding officer advised me to come back to uh, go to school, finish school. So I come back in two years, finished junior high and high school in 1940. 47 it was. And then uh, all that time I was in Marine Reserve. All the time I went through high school on GI Bill Wright. And then when I uh, finished high school, then I uh, went back on active duty in, in 1949 there, back on duty. And I winded up at the uh, shipyard in Frisco, California. I stayed there and they put me on at the Golden Gate Cemetery seven days a week from sun up to sundown. I was helping with burying bodies they was bringing back from overseas. And I got tired of that after about three or four months of that and put in and go to overseas. And so I was put in the go and they were going to send me to Kwanjalein Islands. It's sort of like Wake Island, a small Marine Guard detachment, but I had never got to Kwanjalein yet. So two weeks out from Frisco, the Korean War broke out. I was aboard a merchant ship, and so I got to Hallelujah, and I spent about three or four weeks in Hallelujah, and then they took about 500 of us and put us on Pan American Clippers and flew us from uh, uh, Hawaii to uh, Tokyo. And there in Tokyo, they issued us some rifles and our gear. And there, there they put us on Marine Air Wing plane and sent us to Pusan. So I got to Pusan about the last of June, first of July, I don't remember correctly. The first of July? Uh, July of 1950, and I got there, and as soon as I got there, uh, some of the other Marines, the uh, battalion of us, and we started pushing on up towards Tegu, and uh, and from Tegu, we walked, went all the way to Necton River and everything, fight for the way, all the way up there. I was a scout for the our platoon there, which go out round about. What was your unit? First Division? First Marine Division, uh, Fifth Marines, First Battalion. Fifth Regiment? Yeah. And? And First Battalion, Able Company, First, first Fire Team, mm -hmm. and First Squad. I was first of everything. 
first company and first com platoon. Yeah. And every time the, the dirty detail come up, the first thing they would think about was A company. Said in the alphabet, A is number one. And so they'd always call on us to do all of the dirty work. What was your specialty? Scout, I, I infantry. Just a scout. Yeah, yeah. In the line companies, they call it in the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. So at Naktong Perimeter, how was the battle there? Where? Battle in Naktong River. Oh, it, it was bad. It was real bad. Tell me the thing. details. And uh, well, uh, they told us on the way up there, we, on the way up to Nekton, see, we hadn't had our shoes off or hardly anything to eat. We just had to leave a lot of stuff to eat, what we could find among the, the countryside there. The army was supposed to furnish our rations and everything. But we maybe twice a week or something we would get rash sea ration, so we had to get what we could everywhere else. And my outfit most of the time we gave a lot of our our food mostly to the little orphans we would find little Korean orphans, little kids and elderly people just on the side of the road and everything, and whatever we could find to eat or anything that's what we ate. And uh, but anyway, we got up to the Necton River. They told us said when the battle was over at Necton, said we would get a hot meal, and uh, everybody gets to take a bath in uh, the river up there. Cause when we left Pusan down there, uh, oh, it's there in last July. We left going all the way up to the Necton. We never got to take our uh, shoes off or anything because uh, we wore leggings, the Army wore combat boots, and we would start out early in the morning just at daybreak, had so many mountains to fight and go over the hills. And sometimes we didn't finish fighting, sometimes 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night when we secured the mountains we got to. But anyway, the battle we got up there, we found a, a lot of uh, the army had ran off and left a lot of their wounded and dead up there. And we found them and they ran off and left all their equipment, artillery and machine guns and rifles. And, and the North Koreans used that on us, what, what the army, American army left. Then they, we got it right back in lead and everything. But the battle is a lot of hand-to-hand, -hand. and on one mountain there was going up there, and uh, me, two guys, one on each side of me, we started up this here one mountain, and it was a North Korean dug in on the side. And I was leading in each one, and why, I, I don't know to this day why, but this here Korean dug in on the side of the mountain, he shot and killed the guy, my buddy, on my left-hand side. Then he turned and he shot, uh, they had boat action rifle. Then he shot the buddy on my right. And when he shot him, and I, I started, started him, I was just right up there on him. And he was trying to boat, and his rifle jammed on him. And when his rifle jammed, he could shoot me, but I had a bayonet, so I used my bayonet. Oh. And when I did, and when I did it and I twisted it, when I did, I broke uh, broke off my bayonet in him. But it, it was uh, pretty rough, uh, everything, yeah. a lot of the other things. In my rifle, I lost a rifle and there. All, the, all our ammunition and all our equipment and everything was left over for World War II. was stored in the caves in Imo Jima and Okinawa. And when, we, when they brought that stuff and the ammo into us in Korea there, a lot of it didn't work. And so I, I had lost two rifles that malfunctioned, quit working and everything. So my buddy that got killed there beside me, I uh, picked up his BAR, he had that, so that's what I carried for the rest of my days in Korea. I, I was a bar man. 
But when we got through the battle at Necton, we went down to the river to start taking the taking their clothes off, bathing, because that's been like say eight weeks since we had our clothes off and everything. And uh, so we started taking our clothes off, and we heard somebody hollering, "You can't come in! You can't come in!" And we looked down there; it was a a lady down there in the in the river bathing. And come find out, we told her, said, we're coming in. Said, we ain't had their old bath in eight weeks and hadn't shaved or anything. We're coming in there. Come find out, there's a war correspondent, Mar Mar Margie Higgins. Margaret, Margie Higgins, I think, was American war correspondent. Huh. Some way, she could get, the Army had brought her up around where we was up walking on the way over there, they brought her up on the opposite side from where we was, <laughs> and there she was. But she didn't, didn't mind. We got in and got talking and enjoyed it. But our meal, they offered our meal, they promised our meal we got there when we got out. Up there they brought up sauerkraut and vine and sausage and crackers. That was our wonderful meal that we got. <laughs> But that, that's the way it went there, and then from there, after we got through there, they brought us back down. We didn't know what we was doing. We walked all the way back down to Pusan, and when we got back down to Pusan, they put us on the, on the piers there and had ships tied up. They went and took, the, took our leggings and took our sh shoes off. We called boondockers there. In Marine Corps, and uh, we had gold board ship. My feet is swollen up, wading them rice paddies. Had to wade rice paddies sometime up to your hips in there, with all that honeydew on there, mm. and everything. And but we didn't know if we come back what we was get going to be getting ready, prepared for the Inchon landing, and so a two typhoon blowed in. And this typhoon blowed in, delayed the Inchon landing for two weeks. And uh, in the meantime, we had to go board ship two times a day for about 40 minutes, soak our feet in some kind of purple solution called wading them rice bags and all of that time not taking the shoes and socks off. We Our feet had swollen up. But anyway, when the poops, uh, when the Typhoon left and everything on September the 15th at 5 o'clock, we landed at Inchon. And the, before we got to Inchon, while we was on the pier, they brought in material. We had to make ladders and with hooks on the top of them. And they told us we are going to be landed. Where we landed, them ladders going to be in front of the landing craft, going to hang them up over the seawall about 15 feet up. And so we had to go up over the seawall on them ladders and everything. So we went from uh, Inchon to Seoul, secured it. And then I went you participated in September 15th? Huh? September 15th, first day of Inchon landing? Uh -huh. Yeah. So was it dangerous? I mean, were oh, there yeah. much resistance from North yeah. Korea? Yeah, quite a bit. Uh, we, uh, but because you were scout, you were first soldiers in the Lanchon landing or what? Well, uh, no, uh, uh, the scout didn't camp you right in front of the landing barge there. But the uh, scout is usually after the, you get in inland and, and going down the roads right. and everything. But uh, we had a cemetery at Inchon up to a right on high bank. Had some North Koreans up in there firing down on us down there. Had machine guns all out in front of us, right in there. But they told us before, before we got in the landing craft, said, man, if you hit the seawall, get on a ladder, just get up there and fall over. So they said, don't stand there, because you do, you go get shot. Two or three of the guys, would, they get up there and hesitate, and when they did, they got shot. And everything, but when I came up, my time to go over to see. Well, I just got up there. I rolled over and dropped about six, seven feet on the other side there. But we went from there to Seoul, uh, and after we secured Seoul, went to 38. 
our my outfit was the first uh, UN forces that crossed the 38th parallel. Mm -hmm. But we got up there and they stopped us after we got about 150 yards outside the 38. They made us come back and we come on back and got aboard ship at Inchon. And that's when we went back around to Wonsan mm -hmm. to make a landing at Wonsan to go to the Chosen Reservoir. But for, for about two days before we could land at Wonsan, we had to, they had, had the harbor heavily mined with mines there. So me and my buddy, we sat on front of the ship every morning. We'd get, get on front of the bow of the ship and we'd go along there, we shooting mines, blowing the mines up. And when it started getting dark, but the ship would turn around and go back towards Pusan. And early next morning, we'd find ourselves coming back and we went there for two days, back and forth there, shooting mines, trying to clear the way. They had no way to clear the harbor so the ships could get in. So after two days, we landed at Wonsan. And from Wonsan, we started walking all the way up to the reservoir up there. And just before we got to the reservoir, chosen reservoir, uh, we had rock Marines, the Republic of Korean Marines. And and they uh, they we had two in our outfit. Each platoon had two, and uh, they were used for interpreters if we got prisoners and anything. But they told us that the the lake, the reservoir up there, says frozen over. Said we could save two days by crossing the reservoir, but if we don't don't choose to go that way, it's gonna take two or three days longer to take the road and go across. But said the front reservoir that froze said the ice is about five feet thick on that reservoir. Said it'll crack, but it won't give away. Said if you won't take a chance, we go. So we chose to go across it. So we started across, got out there about halfway across it. It started cracking. That's when we st started tightening up, <laughs> and then we started cracking, but it never gave up. But so we left and went on up to Hagaru and Coteria and on up my platoon, uh, Able Company. We went the furthest on up the other side of Coteria, and uh, there we went within six miles of of a Mancure border and everything. And then we was up in there, and it's already cold, getting cold and everything. All we have is just a, a parker. And they issued us rubber galoshes. And that's the worst thing you can wear in weather like that because your feet sweat and you got to keep your toes moving. If you don't, you lose them. But anyway, we got up there and, and uh, they sent us on the tomb one morning. We got up about 4.30 and left out, went out scouting to see what we could find. We hadn't had no problems or nothing. So we went way out about five, six miles way out in no man's land. And uh, we took, got into a skirmish out there from North Korea and took two prisoners and brought them back. We didn't know what day it was or anything, but when we came back in that night, they had a, uh, we didn't know it, that the Air Force had parachuted. It was Thanksgiving Day. And we didn't know, you know, we didn't have radio, to, no, Ain't they had calendars or nothing. We didn't know what day it was. And so we come back and the Air Force had parachuted us a, a Thanksgiving dinner. And that was the first a real good meal we had in about uh, two weeks. And uh, But wasn't it frozen because it's too cold? Huh? Wasn't it frozen? Yes, I got froze. I got knocked unconscious uh, on a 20... On the 28th of uh, November of 1950, uh, I, I, Chinese, our two prisoners we had to taken, had told us that the Chinese was up there, had us surrounded, was coming in there trying to surround us, and told us. So we, when we come back in that night eating that turkey dinner, we told them, and they sent word to Tokyo, and Tokyo the Air Force said it wasn't no Chinese within 200 miles. Right. But, 
But come find out, they was right there, and they was dressed in white. And the Air Force would fly over, and now all that snow on the ground, they couldn't see them. But at night, you could see them and hear them. And so they, they, they come one night and tripped some flares and everything, and, and that's when I seen them, and I had two done shoot up my weapon and everything, threw it down and grabbed two grenades and went to held them there on my thumb and pulled the pin, had them up to my stomach on my knees, and I seen them coming up, up the mountain, looked about a thousand or two thousand of them, just looked like a bunch of little ants coming up. And I had them grenades and I just fixed it, just fixed to draw back on them. And when I did, a blast went off right behind me, a, a concussion blast. I don't know what it was, artillery or a mortar round or what, but what it did, when it did, I fell over face down in the snow. And uh, when I fell over in the snow, it blew my helmet off and everything. They found me the next day, the sergeant found me face down in there and they was out collecting dog tags. And so they rode me over and I didn't know it. And they, I felt somebody kept slapping my face and hollering to wake up, wake up. And then hollered and I wouldn't and directly the sergeant said, damn it. He said, wake up, wake up. And so finally I'll come to and everything. And when he looked down he seen my hands, I had two live grenades with a pin pulled. He hollered for the corpsman to come over and said, I found a live one over here. This one's live. Said he got two grenades with the pins pulled, come tape his hands up before his hand thaws out. So they got me and took me down to the aid station and got me down there and everything. And so uh, got my found pins up there, went up there, sent somebody up there, found some pins, they come back, put in the grenades, and they got that and untaped my hand and worked my hands open and finally got my hands open when they did the skin and everything come off there and everything. So they worked with me a little while and a little later, the corpsman come back by there and brought me the little bottle. And he said, here, I said, what is it? He said, that's bourbon. I said, that's 90 proof bourbon. I said, I don't drink. He said, I want you to drink that. I said, I don't drink. I don't want it. He said, your system's almost shut down. I said, if you're going to make it, you're going to have to drink this. I said, if you don't drink this, you ain't going to make it. You're just about dead if you didn't know it. He said, I'm going to give you this, and then I'll be back in about 15 minutes bring you another one. So he had to hold it because my hands were froze and the skin out of them and I couldn't hold it. So I held my mouth open, he pulled it down, felt like a flamethrower <laughs> going down. But he come back, I seen what he meant by by uh, it being, uh, you know, get your body, get your system up, cause man, it heats you up real fast like that. But I found out later, after I got out of there, it took us about, we had no food or nothing for about two and a half weeks coming off the reservoir. Lived on two a day, little be them Tootsie Rolls, like a, like your little finger. That's what I had, one, uh, two a day for two and a half weeks till I got to Army Hospital in southern Japan there. Took us about two, two and a half weeks to get off of the, off of the reservoir. So, December 7th, 8th, I was the last one they flew out from Hung Dam. They made an airfield up there and brought in some planes to fly the real wounded out, and the worst, to fly them into Japan. And the ones that wasn't the worst, they put them on a hospital ship there in one song. But when we came off the reservoir, we, the first thing we did, uh, no, nobody in military history had ever done it. We brought out 105 civilians, North Korean men, women, and children. The first time that ever happened. And they took all of them, I found out later, they took all of them and st put them on the ship, all the Navy ships and the sailors board the ship. They gave up all their 
the clothes and, and blankets and everything. And they had so many on there, plus the American military, they had to make them all stand up till they got down to Seoul, back down towards uh, South Korea and Pusan. And aboard them ships at that time, I found out later that out of 750 babies were born before they got got the South Koreans back down to uh, North Koreans back down to South Korea there. And so we really brought out about 112, 14 uh, North Koreans counting the babies. And I found out since then that the uh, what well, it's all about heard about a million and a half of descendants of those we brought off the chosen reservoir lives in the United States to this day. So after you came from Hamung Hungnam to Busan, right? Where did you go? Go come from where? From Busan. Where did you go? Oh, but oh, you from Hungnam, you went to Japan, right? They flew me to, to the Japan. Army Hospital in South Japan. I stayed there two or three days. And then they put the, all the Marines and sailors on on train and sent us up to uh, Yokosuka Naval Base in Japan there. Mm -hmm. So I spent two after I got out of the hospital. And they, they took the ones that was able to walk. After I was in there about two weeks, two and a half, they took the Marine AAA outfit there in Yokosuka and sent them to Korea and took all of us as able to walk, put us in the AAA over there. And the doctors told them, said they ain't, they ain't gonna be liable for what they do. Said they ain't had no sleep or anything for, for the two and a half, three weeks. And said if they go to sleep on guard duty, you can't do nothing to them or anything. But anyway, I made it over there and I stayed two and a half years and made me uh, in this AAA outfit that made us, we thought that none of us had ever been on nothing but 30 and 50 caliber. And here they had 40 millimeters and quad 50s and everything in this AAA outfit. Did you know anything about Korea when you left for Korea? Did I what? Did you know anything about Korea when you left for Korea? Did I know anything? About Korea? No. I had no idea, didn't know where it was or anything. Didn't know anything. All I know is just a barren land where the Japanese had occupied it for 50 years. And, and, and there's no trees, no nothing, just rice paddies and, uh, and, uh, and all of just barren land everywhere and grass, the straw grass huts, mud huts, and everything. When you left Korea, you were wounded from Chosen uh, mm -hmm. Reservoir, and you've been to Busan, Daegu, Nakdong, Incheon, Seoul, and then Wonsan. You've been seeing all of this completely destroyed. How about Korean people? How did they look? at the time when poor, you were there? Poor, they, they're real pitiful and they didn't have much to eat. And I'd noticed some of them, all of them would carry a little bit of net, a little thing like in, you see, they go buy goldfish in a store. They did, I noticed all of them would come down the roads and everything, and the rice paddy, they use rice paddies to grow minnows. And they'd grow them minnows in there and I noticed they would stop be carrying big loads of wood on their backs or, or stuff on their head. And they would get hungry. They would stop, uh, go over to the rice paddy and dip that little net down in there and, and get a thing full of, of minnows. They'd be wiggling and they'd open their mouth and throw the handful of minnows in their mouth. And that's what food they could have. And if they could find any bark anywhere, they ate the food. They had very little food and everything. Japanese had took everything from them and never let them have anything. And they was really, you know, they was real thrilled to see us that we came in to help them. So that's where I learned as much, 
uh, share my food and everything with the little kids and old people. And I, uh, lots of times I would eat what I would find, come across them. Uh, they have a little garden and they have them big old white reddishes, icicle, big white long, and you bite into them and them things well like a jalapeno pepper, <laughs> hot, real hot. Then once in a great while, you might find a little apple tree somewhere, it had them little bitty small apples, and you grab one and start eating it, bite into it, eat it, and you look down there at it, and it'd be about four half worms in there. So you ate it and swallowed it anyway, so you had the apple and, and you had your proteins at the same time, and that's all the food we had there. When did you go back to Korea? About four years ago. But the 2009? Nine. Nine. Ten? Huh? 2010 or yeah. nine? Nine, I believe it was. Yeah, nine. And what did you see there? A beautiful country. More beautiful just everywhere. Just trees cultivated everywhere. Flowers everywhere. Didn't see no rice paddy. I seen one rice paddy. It's like the, the North Kore uh, the Korean government and the military Academy, it took me all over South Korea, East and West Coast, and all that. And it, you couldn't even tell there had been a war there. And the people, everywhere we would stop, the people would come up to us, and little kids and old people, hug, hug us and holler, our heroes, our hero. And they'd come up and sing for us and sing for us and everything. And so the people, it's a beautiful country. In fact, it's more beautiful than, than I've seen it in lots of places in the United States there. You don't see waste of trash along the highways. You don't see cigarette butts. You don't see gum wrappers. You don't see fast food things. And the people over there are just nice as they be dressed well. And, uh, and like I say, they love Americans. And we love them too. And, and I love them. If I had another place to live, that's where I would want to live. Did you have any hope for about the future of Korea when you left Korea? Did, to, did you thought? Did you think that Koreans would develop like this? No, never thought. Never thought in anything. Nowadays, their houses they build them sort of like your hand to build them in a cluster about five about 14, 15 stories high. Just all, just, just everywhere, just all on the countryside and everywhere. And at night time, we'd be traveling on the bus at night, and the countryside's lit up everywhere. It's lit up everywhere. And their interstate highways a lot better than ours. And the traffic flows more smoothly and everything. And people well-dressed, well-respected and everything. So what is Korea now? You didn't know this country. You went everywhere. You saw everything destroyed. Korean people were miserable. When you left, you didn't. You never thought that could come out like this. No. What is Korea to you now? The country you didn't know now. What is yours? A paradise. It's, it's I mean, a, to you. To me. Yeah. What is Korea to you? Is it? Well, to me, I know of now that the people are more educated. They're, it, we cause them to be educated and be what they are today, a good Christians. And now they have the, the biggest Baptist church in the world is in Seoul, the biggest. And they send out missionaries to my country, to the United States. And I only the place over, I know it's all across in there, you see the houses, the churches, the clusters of high-rise homes. You would always, one building be there with a big red cross on it. At night time, you see that big red cross, that was their church. And I've seen one Catholic church. I've seen the Pentecostal and Baptist churches. And the people are highly religious and, and believe in what they do. And I, I don't know, it just, uh, it's just a wonderful feel, feeling to know that I'm a part of it and of what we did is uh, 
made a, took a, a barren land, made a paradise out of a barren land. People would have to see it in 50 to see what it was. In the minds of American people, the Korean War regarded as forgotten war. That's right. Why and what do you think about that? Well, it, it disappoints me that, that the Democrats, in the, when we was on the reservoirs begging for ammunition, food, and winter clothes, and Truman sent word back, they sent word to Truman, and the word they sent back by radio, 17,000 men said, write them off. In other words, don't send them nothing, they can't come out or anything. Said, so just write them off. So that, that hurt the morale and everything. So the commandant of the Marine Corps back then got a hold of uh, MacArthur and the uh, Air Force, well, not mostly MacArthur, the Air Force General of the Air Force in Japan and the Admiral of the Navy in Japan and told them, he said, I know my men, said, well, I know how they train, how they fight. Said they need ammunition, need food, need winter clothing. Said if you just parachute them some over there, I know they will come out. They'll bring all their equipment, they'll bring out all their wounded, bring out all their dead. If you just parachute them, send them some equipment. So they sent us, they okayed it, and so the Air Force got together with the Navy to send ships over there before they come off the reservoir pick them up at one sign, and the Air Force came over and the first parachute drop, they dropped it to the Chinese up there. So we watched the Chinese get what we were supposed to get, so we radioed back and told them they missed our lines. So they came back and they brought us some more uh, ammunition and stuff back and some, a lot of the mortar rounds and a lot of the ammunition, the artillery rounds, well, like I say, we left in the caves after World War II for five years, and a lot of it didn't work. But anyway, we know to this day that we was a part. We stopped communism. That's where communism worldwide was stopped in, was at the Chosen Reservoir and in Korea. And so we, we, the forgetting the war, that's the reason why we say, the reason why they won't forget the Democrats and Truman, they won't forget how they treated us and what they done for us, and they don't want the American people to know what they did to us and wrote us off there. So that's the reason why they call it the Forgotten War. The American people don't know to this day a lot of them unless we tell them what happened and when and where and mm. how. You made an excellent point. Um, how do you think we can um, make this war not forgotten and so that our young generations know about this? Teach, start teaching in the schools the, the children thing. I noticed after I went back to Korea in 2009, I noticed that the Korean schools, the little kids, they are uh, in kindergarten. They take them around to all the ins, ins, where the battles were, the military cemetery, and, and everywhere, and they teach them, show them how they got their freedom, that we gave them their freedom, and, and show them how their freedom was won and what, what we meant to them and everything. And that's what the American people is liking, the, the, to teach little school, they take their history out of the school. They take religion out of the school. G grandmothers and grandfathers and all with, with, with heads on the education people to stand up to teach the younger generation and learn from our experience and learn to respect how they're free and why they're free and hope that they stay free and that to this day, they better wake up to realize what's going on right mm -hmm. to this 